Please all stand. So you say that. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, Your Honour. I, I, unfortunately, Mr. Stewart launched into his opening. I didn't want to interrupt him. That's all right. I'm sorry. And you? Sorry, you? Um, Mr. Tokley with Mr. Gibson for the Society, Your Honour. For the Society? Yes, is that, thank you, Your Honour. Is that the only appearance? It, yes, it is, Your Honour. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. Yes, thank you. Um, Your yes, Honour, I should call Terence John O'Brien and Rodney Peter Spinks. Uh, Gentlemen, you both need to be sworn. Will you take an oath from the Bible? Would you both stand for me? There should be a Bible there. If you'd stand and take the Bible and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. The evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. The evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing, nothing but, but the truth. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, uh, I'll start with you. Would you state your full names, your position in the organisation and your address? Yes, my name is Terence John O'Brien. My position with the organisation, as you mentioned, I'm a director of the Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Australia. Uh, I'm currently not serving as the coordinator of the branch committee in Australasia. I have an assignment in Papua New Guinea for 12 months, um, but I've kept up to date with the uh, information to do with the Royal Commission. That's why I've come back for the hearing. Um, so presently I reside in the branch facilities in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Um, when, when did you um, cease having the responsibility of coordinator of the branch committee? Beginning in October 2016. And who is the current coordinator? Name is Winston Payne. Um, thank you. And uh, Mr Spinks, I'm coming to you. Would you state your full names, your position in the organisation? Rodney Peter Spinks. Uh, I'm the senior service desk elder in the service department. And I take it that you you based at um, the Jehovah's Witness Bethel in New South Wales? That's correct. And um, Mr O'Brien, that would be true of you as well. Oh, well, you know I'm in Papua New Guinea, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm here temporarily just for this two weeks, but otherwise in Papua New Guinea. Right. Thank you. Um, Mr O'Brien, if I can refer you um, in the tender bundle to the document at tab one, it's a response uh, to the Royal Commission that's dated 3 January 2017, and uh, it's signed by you. Uh, are you familiar with that document? Yes. Um, and is it uh, true and correct? Yes. And then Mr O'Brien and Mr Spinks, I referred you to uh, your joint statement, which is uh, at tab 2, dated 24 February 2017. Mr O'Brien, to the best of your knowledge and ability, is it true and correct? Yes. Mr. Spinks? Yes. Um, Your Honour. Mr. Stewart, we might just mark the tender bundle. That was my proposal. 54 1. And now, Mr. O'Brien, I take it that following the hearing, in case study 29, there was discussion at the branch committee level in relation to various sort of the points and issues that had arisen in the Royal Commission hearing. Is that right? Yes. Can you explain what process uh, Watchtower Australia uh, went through in order to address the issues that had been raised? So, as a branch committee, we considered the various issues as they applied to us as a branch committee, what areas of responsibility we could um, implement any suggested changes. Um, as the, you would know, we had representatives from our world headquarters 
legal department here at case 29 um, and they returned with the um, case reports and they've obviously looked at the reports in between. We've also since had members of our legal department here in Australia um, spend time at World Headquarters. So many of these issues have been discussed and that's where we are at present with them. And was there consultation between the branch committee and World Headquarters in relation to any of the issues? Yes, definitely. And in what way did that consultation take place? Well, first, as I mentioned, the two legal representatives who were here took back the information after conferring with uh, the branch committee before leaving. Then we had members of our legal department over there in consultation. And then in between, we've had, um, uh, prior to my going to Papua New Guinea, I was involved in some, but since then, too, uh, quite a number of video conferences with personnel from World Headquarters Legal, our legal, our branch committee. And um, those discussions, I take it, were exploring uh, what between you regarded to be uh, necessary or advisable changes, would that be right? Yes, where we could improve in our policy and practices and procedures. That was the, the content of the discussions. And I suppose you also identified what you regarded to be scriptural impediments to any changes. Yes, that was part of the subject of discussion, but the, the scriptural content of any change that would be referred back to um, a different committee of the governing body. That's not something the branch committee would review. Which committee of the governing body would that be? Well, probably the teaching committee of the governing body. And did the organisation in Australia take any external advice with regard to uh, what procedures uh, should be introduced or what changes should be made? We considered um, the many reference materials that were provided um, to and by the Royal Commission. Um, we reasoned that these are the ones with expertise that the Royal Commission has confidence in. So we've considered the various reports and um, case studies that were provided. And so if I'm to understand your answer correctly, you didn't take specific external expert advice with regard to changing your policies or procedures? Not outside of what was presented to the Royal Commission, no. Now, the upshot of that process you've described, as I understand it, uh, is that initially at least two new documents were produced, one a guide to service desks and one uh, a letter to elders, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It's just as well to identify them because they um, become the critical documents. So if I can refer you to the document at tab 6. Well, actually, let's start at, if I may, at tab 7. I beg your pardon. It will come up on the screen. It uh, should be on the screen in front of you. You can use either the yeah. screen or a physical uh, representation as, as you choose. Uh, now, that is a letter to all bodies of elders dated 1 August 2016. Uh, it's on the letterhead of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia. Now, first, I take it it was sent to all the bodies of elders uh, under the responsibility of the Australia branch. Is that right? That's correct. And um, it's in identical or near identical form to a letter which was, to the best of your knowledge, sent to all bodies of elders around the world. Is that right? Yes, with obviously there would be some um, local adjustments depending on the um, legal aspects of different uh, branch territories. And so this letter was specifically um, authorised by the World Headquarters, is that right? Yes. And then <clears throat> the other document uh, at tab 6 is the 
child protection guidelines for branch office services, and it's referred to as the S66 document, etc. That's correct. And that, as I understand it, was um, sent to uh, particular offices at service desks of branch offices around the world, is that right? As I understand, yes. Yes. So, if I understand this correctly, neither of these two documents go to ordinary congregates uh, of the Jehovah's Witnesses, is that correct? No, they have a particular audience, so the branch guidelines were prepared specifically to assist our service desks at branches in knowing how to respond to uh, elders who would call in for direction. The letter to the bodies of elders was provided for that audience, specifically for elders, so they would know what their obligations were how to best handle any accusations of child abuse and uh, consequent um, shepherding, shepherding of the uh, victims. Now, I'll come in a moment to um, the document dated 7 March 2017, in other words, just a bit earlier this week. Um, but leaving that document, that very recent document, to one side, uh, is it the case then that insofar as the organisational response to allegations of child sexual abuse is concerned, ordinary congregants who are not elders and not deskmen, as they refer to as the service desk, uh, would have regard to the publication organised to do Jehovah's Will to find the organisational response? Yes, although that document, whilst these two documents are specifically dealing with child abuse matters, the Organised to do Jehovah's Will is a publication um, that has very little to do with child sexual abuse. It's basically talking about the um, general um, min sorry, ministry of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, I understand that. So still leaving aside the document of 7 March 2017, um, if a congregant wants to know what processes there are uh, that the organisation follows in the event that an allegation of child sexual abuse uh, is raised, there's no specific policy document that they can have any access to, is that right? No, leaving aside that document which now corrects that. Yes. yes. And so to the extent that they could learn anything about, for example, the two witness rule or the judicial process within the organisation, they would be left with uh, organised to do Jehovah's Will? No, I think the average member of a congregation um, has an exhaustive references to what we call the Watchtower Library and subjects such as those you've mentioned uh, considered in Watchtower articles that um, everyone has access to. And many of those going back over a long period of time. And, and recent, yes. So the most recent back to, I think, as far as 1930. So by the recent ones, are you referring to articles referenced um, by you in your response and in your joint statement that have been published since case study 29? Yes, there some, but then there are other Watchtower study articles that are reviewed at congregation meetings uh, which would contain um, other relevant information but not specifically only dealing with um, the same as those reference materials which are specific on child abuse. So an ordinary congregant would have to go doing their own research through those various publications you've mentioned to find the answer on any particular topic related to child sexual abuse, is that right? Yes, but the Watchtower Library is very much a user-friendly um, program which most of Jehovah's Witnesses have little trouble finding their way through. Well, I, I think you accepted on the previous occasion, uh, Mr O'Brien, that there was uh, an absolute need uh, in the organisation to bring these policies and procedures together in an easily accessible place for congregants. You we call that? Yes, which is what we've done. And, and that's what's led to the 7 March 2017 document, is that right? Yes, because yes. now it's specifically dealing with child abuse matters. Yes.